is the most powerful thing that exists in the earth. Jesus is the Word made flesh. So when we approach the Word of God, we need to do it with reverence and with our full attention. The Word of God is not ordinary plain words, but they're words that are packed with life-changing power. And I believe that when the Word is preached, that miracles are available to change lives, to save, to heal physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually. Thoughts always go before actions. I always say that where the mind goes, the man follows. And I think that's very true. The Bible teaches us in Romans chapter 8, verse 5, that those who are according to the flesh and are controlled by its unholy desires have set their mind on and pursue those things which gratify the flesh. So it's, it's very plain right there. If you're walking after the flesh, if I'm walking after the flesh, it's because I've put my mind on fleshly things and therefore that's what I'm pursuing. <laughs> Whatever we put our mind on, that's what we're going to go after. Our mind affects our emotions. What we think comes out of our mouth. It affects all of our actions. Then it goes on to say, but those who are according to the Spirit and are controlled by the desires of the Spirit set their minds on and seek those things which gratify the Spirit. Now let me just say this. You cannot have a fleshly mind and have a spiritual life. It's not going to work. So we have to learn how to think things on purpose that are going to benefit us. Proverbs 23, 7 says, As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. One translation says, Or so does he become. The Bible teaches us, especially in 2 Corinthians 10, 4, and 5, that there's a war going on that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations, reasonings, theories, and every proud and lofty thing that exalts itself against the true knowledge of God. Those scriptures are talking about the mind and how there's a battle that rages in the mind. The mind is the battleground where Satan tries his level best to take control of our lives. Satan comes to kill, steal, and destroy. But Jesus said, I came, and I'm so glad he did. I came that you might have and enjoy your life and have it in abundance to the full until it overflows. Every one of you has a blood-bought, Christ-paid-for, God-ordained right to enjoy every single moment of your life. We are not here for misery. We are here to enjoy our lives. Amen? And the devil doesn't want us doing that. He doesn't want happy Christians because happy Christians are likely to infect other people with their joy. As long as all the world sees is sad, saved people with bumper stickers and a little Christian jewelry, it doesn't say a thing to them as far as suggesting that they might consider wanting what we have. So whether you know it or not, joy is not only, doesn't only just feel good, it's very necessary. It's the best advertisement that we can have for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Especially when you can go out and be happy when maybe all your circumstances aren't happy. So the devil didn't just start to work on any one of us yesterday or this morning. He's been at it a long, long time. But we have weapons. Thank God that we have weapons. And the weapons all involve the Word of God. The Word that I'm preaching tonight is fighting 
demonic spirits and breaking strongholds off of people's lives. When we hear the Word, speak the Word, meditate on the Word, sing the Word, when we praise God, all of these things are weapons that defeat the enemy. Now the Bible teaches us that our mind has to be renewed. And we're going to talk a lot about that tonight. The devil is a liar, the father of lies. He has carefully studied each one of us for a very long time. But I guess my point is, and my question to you is, how long have you studied him? How quickly do we recognize an enemy attack? How long do we put up with the devil's nonsense before we even bother to say, I know what you're trying to do and you're not going to do it. No matter what lie you tell me, this is what God's Word says and that is what I believe. How long do we just put up with the enemy tormenting us? How many days do we have to be in a fit of depression and full of self-pity before we say, oh, I think I'm under enemy attack? <laughs> Don't wait till you get so bad that it takes a truckload of Christians to come and prop you back up again. <laughs> Let's learn how to do what the Bible says in 1 Peter 5, resist the devil at his onset. Immediately. No, get behind me, shut up, you're a liar, that is not true. And I personally am very big on speaking out loud. I think if you're in a place where you can, you can talk back to the devil. Jesus talked back to the devil and there's no reason why we can't. He's our example. You say, well, when did he talk back to the devil? In Luke chapter 4 and other places. The devil begins early in our life by bombarding our minds with cleverly devised patterns of little nagging, nagging thoughts. Suspicion, doubt, fear, wonderings, reasonings, <laughs> theories. He moves slowly and cautiously. After all, well laid plans take time. A stronghold is an area where an enemy entrenches himself and controls that area. And so when the Bible talks about how we have strongholds in our mind, we have to understand that that's an area where the enemy, Satan, has worked a long period of time and he now is entrenched in that area and he's caused us to believe something that is absolutely not true. However, as long as we believe it's true, no matter how untrue it is, it's true for us. And of course, I had many things in my life that I firmly believed that were absolutely untrue but I did not know they were not true because I did not know the Word of God. I wonder if we have any idea how precious the Word of God is. I'll tell you what, I thank God for what I know. Oh my goodness, I would not take anything for the 37 years I've been studying the Bible. I thank God for what I know. The more you know of the Word, I mean really know, the less likely you are to be deceived. The devil doesn't want you to study. He doesn't want you to be here tonight. And he'll try to do everything he can to distract you because he doesn't want you to get anything out of this. But you don't need to be too concerned because I've already prayed and you are going to pay attention. Period. End of the conversation. And you don't want to go to sleep in here because we have people that will come get you. <laughs> so with these weapons that we have, strongholds can be torn down. So we see so far that we're in a war. Why else would we be called soldiers? 
in the army of God. <laughs> Soldiers and armies are for war. So we're in a war. Our enemy is Satan, not people. <laughs> we war not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and wickedness in high places. And I know, you know, we don't like, yeah, I don't know, Joyce. I, I'm not real comfortable about all this devil talk. These deep, you know, that, that kind of spooky. Well, <laughs> would you rather spend the rest of your life deceived and miserable? Or would you like to face the truth that you have an enemy? You don't need to be also concerned about him because God is much greater than he is, but neither can you ignore him. <laughs> Jesus did not ignore the devil, and we cannot ignore him either. Our mind is the battlefield. The devil works diligently to set up strongholds in our mind. He takes his time to work out his plan. So now, we're going to examine a little bit about how this plan works by me sharing a parable with you, and it's not a parable that Jesus told. This is my own parable that I made up, and it's in this book, Battlefield of the Mind, and so you're just going to have to indulge me and let me read you a little story here. Mary and her husband, John, are not enjoying a happy marriage. <laughs> there is strife between them all the time. They're both angry, bitter, and resentful. They have two children that are being affected by the problems in their home. Strife is showing up in their schoolwork. The results of the strife in their home is showing up in their schoolwork and their behavior at school. One of the children is now having stomach problems because of his nerves. Now, some of you might be thinking, well, I'm Mary and I'm married to John. <laughs> Many of you can already recognize where this is going. Well, Mary's problem is that she doesn't know how to let John be the head of their home. She's bossy. <laughs> she wants to make all the decisions, handle the finances, and discipline the children. She wants to work so she'll have her own money because she is independent, loud, demanding, and a nag. So you're probably thinking by now, well, I've got Mary's answer. She needs to be saved. She needs to know Jesus. Well, guess what? She does know Jesus. She received Jesus five years ago, <laughs> only three years after her and John were married. Do you mean there has not been a change in Mary since she's been born again? Well, yes, there has been some change. She now believes that she would go to heaven if she died. But she still lives under constant condemnation because she feels so bad about her behavior that she seems to have no ability to control. She does have some hope now, whereas she had no hope before she met Jesus. She was miserable and hopeless. Now she is just miserable. It's one thing to be a miserable sinner. It's another entirely different thing to be a miserable saint. And I have been both. Mary knows that her attitude's wrong. She wants to change. She's received counseling from two different people. Takes every opportunity to be prayed for. Asks for victory over anger, rebellion, unforgiveness, resentment, and bitterness. Why has she not seen any improvement? <laughs> well, the answer is found in Romans 12. Verse 2. So let's go there and read that before we go any further. Do not be conformed to this world, fashioned after and adapted to its external superficial customs, but be transformed, entirely changed, by the entire renewal of your mind. Be changed by the renewal of your mind. We are saved by the blood of Jesus. We are changed by the power of the Holy Ghost and the renewal of our mind. When you get saved, your mind doesn't get saved. You do get a new mind. You get a mind of the Spirit. You get the mind of Christ. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. But it still has to be developed. It's something that's down deep inside of you. Old habit patterns have to be broken. Strongholds have to be torn down. How many people 
receive Christ as their Savior, they're sincere, they pray a prayer of salvation with somebody, they want to turn their life around, but they never really educate themselves. They don't educate themselves. There's not one person here that would ever expect to go be a doctor with no education. You would not expect to be a good dentist with no education. You would not expect to be a school teacher with no education. Not even a kindergarten school teacher would you expect to be with no education. And yet we expect to be powerhouse, victorious Christians with no education. <laughs> and it just won't work. Now, you know, you've come here tonight because you're people who want to be educated. But guess what? There's millions of other people watching this right now by TV, and many of you don't know zip about the Word of God. And if somebody asks you, you might say, well, yes, I believe in Jesus. But I'm telling you, even if you believe in Jesus and you sincerely believe in Jesus, if you don't know the Word of God, I mean know it, not have a little bit of head knowledge, but know it, then you have no way of being able to discern when the devil is lying to you. And if you let him lie to you, he is going to rule your life. How many years did I go to church week after week after week after week? I was on the evangelism board at my church. I went out and knocked on doors telling people about Jesus out of obligation because I wanted to work for God. I read a chapter a day in my Bible out of obligation. Didn't remember a thing I read, didn't understand the thing that I read. And don't mean it really as any kind of an insult to the church that I went to because to be honest, they taught me a good foundation about salvation by grace. But nobody was teaching me how I could begin to act like a sane human being. I would go to church on Sunday. Like that first
want the number never unwind I want the power to blow through the sky I see her eyes and all I can find Is there someone else I can go? I need so hard to land on these rocks From these rocks and roads that are my name in Seeing red and gray and broken bones I hear your footsteps in the rain When the time makes me feel so sad and lonely And your smile makes us smile so sad and pain When it breaks, when your heart breaks and that heart shakes I just want you to feel my love bring We were meant to be together for it even if there's no It's so hard to land on these roads Down these dark side roads That are my name in Seeing red and gray and broken bones I hear your footsteps in the rain When the time makes me feel so sad and lonely And your smile makes us smile so sad and pain When it breaks, when your heart breaks And that heart shakes I just want you to feel my love bring we want you to be together for it Even if there's nothing left, that's true Listen to the flowers in the crowded rooms Among the meadows with the summer trees And those carrot eyes hiding beneath the trees Where innocence has left us behind Still we love all the pain of the land Oh, will we be lost in love through
fight with my husband all week, yell at my kids all week, be miserable, depressed, angry, just a total mess, and go back to church the next Sunday. And I tell you what, I have been on an all-out rampage for the last 37 years since God touched my life and I've learned His Word to see Christians grow up and mature so they can have what God sent Jesus to die for them to have and so we can be lights in a dark world. Amen. And I feel very passionate about it. And this is where it starts. The renewal of your mind. And it's a process that never stops. Let me tell you, in studying for this series for the last couple of weeks, and the closer I get to the conference, the more I entrench myself and study. The more I meditate on it, the more I've been reading, the more I've been thinking about this. I've been thinking about these scriptures on the mind all day long and it has helped me my thinking has improved by preparing to preach my message on thinking so I always say I'll just be happy to preach to myself even if you don't need it I'll be happy to preach to me we have to have our minds renewed be not conformed to this world but be ye transformed, changed by the entire renewal of your mind that you might prove, prove for yourselves what is the good and perfect and acceptable will of God for you. I don't want to just talk about the good things that God wants me to have. I want to see them. I want them proved out in my life and I don't want to just preach to you about them. I want you to say, Joyce, I got it. I want to hear your testimonies. I've been set free. I'm a new person. My marriage has changed. My kids are different. My home is different. I've got peace in my life. Mary had a problem. <laughs> I'm sure Mary was a sweet girl that loved Jesus, but she had strongholds in her mind. And until they were broken, nothing was ever going to change for her. As a child, Mary had had an extremely domineering father who often spanked her just because he was in a bad mood. If she made one wrong move, he would vent his anger on her. For years, she suffered helplessly as her father mistreated her and her mother. He was disrespectful in all of his ways toward his wife and daughter, and Mary's brother however, could do no wrong. It seemed as if he was favored just because he was a boy. By the time she was 16, Mary had been brainwashed for years by Satan, who had been telling her lies that went something like this. Men really think they're something. You know they're all alike. You can't trust any of them. They'll hurt you and take advantage of you. Now, if you're a man, you've got it made in life. You can do anything you want. You can order people around, be the boss, treat people any way you please, and nobody, especially not wives or daughters, can do one thing about it. As a result, Mary's mind was resolved and steadfast. When I get away from here, nobody is ever going to push me around again. <laughs> I was sexually abused by my father who was alcoholic and violent and mean, and this went on for years and years, and I watched him come home Every Saturday night, a drunken mess, many nights, beat my mother. My mom didn't know how to do anything about what he was doing to me, and so she turned toward my brother and adored him and left me in the situation that I was in. So I did not have a very good opinion of men. I made 
inner vows. I made a covenant with myself. God wants to have a covenant with us to take care of us. He doesn't want us to have a self-covenant where we say, when I get out of here, nobody's ever going to hurt me again. I will take care of myself and I will never ask anybody for anything. Now, some of you may not have a clue what I'm talking about, but how many of you do? How many of you get this and you're like, been there, done that, know exactly what you're talking about? So now, Mary's got real problems because she comes into this marriage wanting to be loved, wanting to give love, but she's got a really, really, really bad attitude. And it comes from all the lies that Satan has told her all these years taking one situation now and telling her every man is like that, everybody's like that, you can't trust anybody, you have to take care of yourself. <laughs> so now she's in a relationship with God who wants to take care of her, except she doesn't have any idea how to let God take care of her. She's a Christian though. She goes to church, but she doesn't know enough to begin to realize, I have been robbed. The devil has lied to me. And we're going to have a turnaround in this life. Amen. Mary cannot control her actions simply because she does not control her thoughts. <laughs> And she doesn't control her thoughts because she doesn't even know that's an option. <laughs> now, the thing I have to get across tonight, just trying to lay a foundation, is that you don't have to think everything that falls in your head. The Word of God, when you know it, becomes a filter for your life. And I think about this sometimes like, when I, when I try to watch television today, which gets to be interesting even trying to find something to watch. But the Word of God is like a filter for me. And it's like, you know, I, I can see two people, they're on a date, next thing you know, they jump in bed with each other, and you know, before you can get the remote and try to change the channel, And so you're aggravated about the whole thing. But you know the thing that's good for me, and I'm sure for many of you, is that don't tempt me to do anything because I have my mind, my, my word filter here. I know it's wrong. But I'm very concerned for all the people in the world who don't know it's wrong. And they're being educated by evil things. And so they think, well, that's just what you should do. I'll tell you the truth. <laughs> The way that people behave on television is just downright stupid. It, I mean, they call it reality TV, and there is nothing reality about it. I mean, I get so tired of watching man kisses woman, woman begins to rip clothes off a man. You know what? I've been married today 47 years. I've yet to rip his shirt off of him. <laughs> Now, you know, <laughs> whoa. And then all that stuff gives, you know, men stupid ideas, and then they're not happy with their wives, and, you know, like, well, why aren't you ripping my clothes off of me? Well, there is nobody ripping. <laughs> so you may be thinking, dear Lord, that woman's crazy. No, I'm just telling you the truth. If we don't talk about these things where we ought to be talking about them, how's anybody ever going to stay out of trouble? I don't need to just talk to you about religious doctrine. Jesus told me to go teach people how to live according to his word. So anyway, you understand what I'm saying. Now. Let's talk about John for a minute, because John had some issues of his own. John needed to be taken the position as the head of the family that God intended him to have to provide spiritual leadership in his home. 
John was born again and knows the proper order for family life. He knows that he should not allow his wife to control the household, the finances, the children, and him. He knows all this, but he doesn't do anything about it except feel defeated and retreat into TV and sports. John lives in his recliner. John should be doing a lot of things, but like Mary, he also has wrong mindsets because of the way he was raised. <laughs> Let me tell you something. If you were raised in a sane, even a reasonably sane home, you should thank God every day. <laughs> Let me tell you something. You are way ahead of the game. Because many of us were raised with dysfunction to the max. I mean, nothing was functioning according to anything normal. And so you come in with so much baggage that it takes you so much time to unpack. <laughs> so I'm just telling you <clears throat> that if you were raised by parents that were even halfway sane and even tried to be decent to you, you should appreciate them and just thank God for every little bit of sanity that you had in your life. And you should be a little more patient with those of us who didn't have it the way you had it. I tell you, my, Dave was a wonderful, spirit-filled, 26-year-old, good-looking, muscular, Lutheran young man. He loved God. He'd been raised by a godly mother, although his father did die from alcoholism. His mother the, the godliness in his home because of her overrode anything that could have been a problem from him. So moms or dads, if, if one or the other of the partner is not doing what they're supposed to be doing and causing problems, you hang on to God. You teach your kids what's right and you can overcome all that. And Dave was wanting to get married. He was praying that God would send him a wife. He was dating three different women at the time, so he was aggressive after it. He wasn't a man who just believed in prayer with no action. He prayed and got about the business of dating. He was looking aggressively. He said he knew none of them was the right one for him. He said, God, give me somebody that needs help. <laughs> Voila. Here I am. I tell you, all you people praying for somebody to marry and you want the perfect this and the perfect that and a spiritual giant and this and that and no flaws and on and on and on. Maybe God wants to use you to help somebody. Did you ever think of that? Oh, well, pressing right on. Well, yes, John should be doing a lot of things he's not doing, but he's also got mindsets that open the door for the devil to hold him captive. There's also a battle you see going on in John's mind. And this is the way it is. You've got two people married. They're not getting along. They're smiling at each other, strife in their heart, battling her mind, battling his mind. The devil's been working on both of them for years and years. They've got all these wrong mindsets. And there is just no hope without the Word of God. There is just absolutely no hope unless people learn the truth and let the truth set them free. We have to to learn how to think right if we ever expect to live right. And you can do your own thinking and you can do it on purpose. You don't have to think everything that falls into your mind if you've got enough of the Word of God in you that when a wrong thought comes, you it doesn't take you but just a few minutes and you think, that's not God and I'm not wasting my time revolving it around in my mind. Like Mary, John was verbally abused in his childhood. His domineering mother had a sharp tongue and frequently said hurtful things like, John, you're just never going to amount to anything. You're a failure. John tried very hard to please his mother because he craved her approval, <clears throat> like all children do. But the harder he tried, the more mistakes he made. He had a habit of being clumsy, and his mother always had something to say about it, told him what a klutz he was. So, of course, that made him nervous, and he dropped more and more things. So he always felt defeated. He experienced unfortunate rejection from children that he wanted to be friends with. Then he liked a girl at high school. She ended up rejecting him. Then a teacher rejected him. And so you get the pattern on and on and on and on and on. 
John is a low-key type person who simply chose not to make waves. For years he's been having thoughts directed into him that go something like this. Well, there's no point in telling anyone anything about what you want because they're not going to listen anyway. If you want people to accept you, you just have to be quiet and go along with whatever they want. Just leave things alone. Nothing you say is going to make any difference anyway. There's no point in saying anything. The few times he tried to stand his ground on any issues, it seemed that he always ended up losing, so he finally just decided that confrontation simply was not worth the effort. I'm going to lose in the end anyway, so he reasoned, why should I even try anything? So he lives in his recliner, and Mary runs around ranting and raving, and then they go to church on Sunday morning. <laughs> and sad to say, 